King Leopold II took control of the Congolese Free State by deceit through torture, imprisonment, maiming and terror of the Congolese people, in the process killing over 10 million. King Leopold II of Belgium yearned for power and set his sights on acquiring land in Africa. His interest in the Congo was sparked by the abundance of precious metals and ivory, which promised an influx of wealth into Belgium, transforming it into a powerful nation. This desire for land, however, was not shared by the Belgian population, and many believed they did not have the funds for a colony. To avoid public backlash, Leopold created the facade of a humanitarian and philanthropist monarch, rather than revealing his true intentions of exploitation. Leopold began the creation of the deceitful barriers around the Congo by extensively lying to his own people. He even went as far as convincing them that his only intention was to end the brutal Arab slave trade in Africa and to Christianize the so-called lazy, violent, and backward people. Leopold's propaganda went beyond the confines of Europe when he sent lobbyists to the United States to disseminate misinformation in major newspapers. In 1884, under President Arthur, the U.S. became the first country to recognize Leopold's ownership of the Congo Free State, announcing its sympathy with and approval of the humane and benevolent purposes of the International Association of the Congo. The major European powers soon followed in recognition of Leopold's state in the General Act, drafted at the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. The invention of the inflatable rubber tire by the Dunlop Company in 1890 made the global rubber demand surge and changed the future of the Congo. The forests of the Congo were crowded with wild rubber vines, and forced labor was imposed to maximize the collection of natural rubber. Slaves had to meet unrealistic quotas, and Congolese men were recruited by European officers to provide oversight and ensure that these quotas were met. These soldiers, known as the Force Publique, were issued guns and munitions to instill fear and kill anyone who failed to meet their quota. To ensure that munition was not being used for recreational hunting, a new rule was put in place demanding that soldiers provide officers with the right hand of each Congolese slave murdered. Soldiers brutally chopped off the extremities of living Congolese to make up for any bullets wasted on hunting and presented these to their superior officers. Chopped off hands became a form of currency in the Congo used by both soldiers and Congolese. In some cases, soldiers were able to shorten their service by collecting more hands than the others. For natives, they could be used to fill rubber quotas, and villages often attacked one another to steal mutilated hands. Unlike the meticulous records kept by the Nazis in World War II, Leopold strategically acquired minimal information and statistics about the Free State by prohibiting the state from publishing a budget and banning critical journalists from entering the territory. The death rates were of genocidal proportions, and although the exact number is unknown, an estimated 10 million Congolese died over 23 years. Despite the lack of information known about the Congo, a group of individuals dedicated themselves to exposing Leopold's inhumane administration to the rest of the world. They began using the media to broadcast their findings in the United States and England, which was crucial to igniting the worldwide resistance movement that unmasked Leopold's Congo in the years to come. Edmund D. Morrell was the first individual to shine light in the darkness of the Congo, and although he never traveled to the territory, he became its most outspoken critic. He oversaw the arrival and departure of the ships traveling between Belgium and Congo at the Elder Dempster Shipping Company in Antwerp. Over time, he became skeptical of the Congolese affairs as he noticed multiple discrepancies between what he witnessed and what the Belgian government was publishing. He concluded that the only answer for his observations could be the use of slave labor, and announced his determination to do my best to expose and destroy what I knew to be legalized infamy. The Congo reform movement had officially begun. Morel moved rapidly with his campaign, beginning with the release of his own truthful and uncensored weekly newspaper, the West African Mail. He gathered testimonies and photographs from missionaries, as well as information from state officials who had worked in the Congo. With his acquired knowledge and evidence, Morel published books, hundreds of articles and pamphlets, and spoke at over 50 mass meetings to raise awareness. Roger Casement was another prominent individual who had spent years in the Congo working multiple jobs in supply and construction and was later appointed as a British consul. Moved by Morel's claims of human rights abuses, the British House of Commons and Foreign Office voted to investigate the Congo question by sending an individual there. Casement stood as the perfect candidate. 
Over the course of his inquiry, Casement witnessed unimaginable atrocities, which he often described in letters sent to the Foreign Office and Congo state officials. In 1903, he returned to London to publish the Casement Report, a process made tremendously difficult by Leopold, who tried to prevent the truth from leaking by demanding that he see the report before its publication and often posing threats. Finally, the report was published in early 1904. The direct tone used to describe what Casement had witnessed allowed the raw atrocities to be presented to the public and convinced readers that Leopold had lied for decades. Morel stated, It was a report which finally, and for all time, was to tear aside the veil from the most gigantic fraud and wickedness which our generation has known. Morel and Casement were inspired by each other's work and decided to collaborate to form the Congo Reform Association. Based in England, individuals of the association dedicated themselves to bringing national attention to the situation in the Congo through the use of the press and mass public speeches. Historian William Roger Lewis summed up the intentions of the group when he stated, the Congo Reform Association was the beginning of a crusade which would end with the walls of the Leopoldian system crumbling before the trumpets of Congo Reform. The first meeting of the CRA, attended by approximately 2,000 individuals, was held in Liverpool's Philharmonic Hall on March 23, 1904. From then on, its numbers increased rapidly as individuals were drawn to the moral aspect of the movement and wanted to play their part in the destruction of Leopold. Through the press, members sent letters to newspapers and parliament urging international intervention. The success of the CRA is greatly attributed to Alice Seeley Harris and Reverend John Harris, who provided the majority of the photographs used in the campaign to evoke emotion in the audience which words could never achieve. The couple traveled to the Congo as missionaries, but soon turned their attention to taking photographs of villagers who had been subjects of the violent force publique. Other missionaries created written reports to accompany the photographs and began sending these home. The most renowned photograph, Nsala of Walla in the Tsongo district, was captured by Harris in 1904. And a native had gone down the path at the back of the station, carrying the hand and foot of his little girl wrapped up in a plantain leaf. When the Harrises returned to England in 1906, they joined the CRA and toured Europe and the United States, where they spoke in public on 600 occasions. They displayed real shikots and shackles and presented their famous lantern slide lectures, scripted horror narratives accompanied by slides of photographs and hymns. With the invention or with the distribution of a portable uh, Kodak camera and, uh, and people photographing and bringing this evidence from Congo, it was directly and, of course, visual material is much more emotional than uh, only a report. It goes more directly to the emotional center of, of the thinking. Branches of the CRA spread to other European countries, such as Germany and France, and became transatlantic in 1904 when the United States established the American Congo Reform Association. Among the members was Vice President Mark Twain, an anti-imperialist who published the satire King Leopold's Soliloquy. Written from Leopold's point of view, the satire highlights the role of the camera in ruining his veiled affairs, stating, The incorruptible Kodak, the only witness I have encountered in my long experience that I couldn't bribe. Like Morel's newspaper, the Congo newsletter was published by the American CRA to bring attention to the issue. While nations from every side of the world were cracking down on the truth, Leopold continuously tried to uphold the barrier of lies through propaganda and lobbyists. In one final attempt at silencing the national fervor targeted at ending his Congo, he organized a group of three men, known as the Commission of Inquiry, to travel to the Congo and argue for his humanitarian work there. This plan completely backfired. On their trip, the men collected hundreds of testimonies from the natives. When the commission returned, they wrote a report which confirmed the evidence surfaced by critics of Leopold's Congo. With international outcry at a peak, Belgium was placed in a vulnerable position, and Leopold was compelled to sell the Congo Free State to the Belgian government in 1908. People tend to, to um, turn a blind eye of what human beings can do to each other. Africa continues to be the forgotten continent. Neighboring countries experience similar histories to that of the Congo, with mass violence, torture, and genocides. However, the barricades constructed through colonialism are yet to be broken, and thousands of stories remain untold. Today, Belgium is one of the richest countries in Europe. But people should ask themselves where all this fortune comes from.